All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to Adobe's In My Creative Classroom, Classroom series. My name is Emily Seamus. I work with the Adobe Education team, and I'm based in San Francisco, California. I'm delighted to have this opportunity to host this month's session of In My Creative Classroom. Uh, this is a Adobe series, series where each month we feature a, a stellar member of our education community who has generously offered to give us a glimpse into their creative world, including highlights of their own creative journey, as well as examples of how they support education in their classroom. So this month we uh, are, have the great luck to be able to speak with Dan Armstrong, excuse me, Dan Armstrong. Dan is an Adobe Education Leader and Educator at Skyview High School in Boise, Idaho. And I'm going to turn it over to Dan in just a moment. But before I do, just wanted to go over a couple of housekeeping issues or items. Uh, first, we like to keep these sessions conversational in nature. So please take advantage of the chat boxes. There's one uh, to the right, which will give you a chance to introduce yourself, tell us where you're from. And the one uh, in the lower left corner, the questions for Dan will follow us throughout the session. So if you ever have questions for Dan, go ahead and put them in that box. I'll be monitoring it and making sure that those get to his attention. So uh, one last item. This session is being recorded. So in the event that uh, you have colleagues who might be interested in hearing what Dan has to say, please just go back to our website and you'll find links in our resource section to this session. So without further ado then, I'd like to introduce you to Dan Armstrong. Hi, Dan. Hey, thanks for having me today, Emily. I appreciate it. Great. Well, if you're ready to get set, I'm just going to go ahead and move to our next screen. And why don't you go ahead, Dan, and go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us more about you. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, well, thanks for coming tonight, guys. I appreciate it. Um, my name is Dan Armstrong, and uh, I... You know, I'm a teacher, like everybody else, and I have kind of a cool story to share. I got a few pictures uh, that I'll share with you guys as I narrate this. If uh, Emily, if you could turn on my screen, and I'll share with these guys. And uh, it's really great. Um, I think I had a, a very, um, what should we say? Uh, my story started with kind of a large, you know, nudge in the back. Uh, I have some of these wonderful individuals. I'll talk about this picture in a second. But what happened is I was always this guy that wanted to do all these cool, creative things. And I was surrounded with great people, but none of them were kind of like technology experts, you know. And so as a student, I struggled a lot to find like technologically savvy people that could lead me down paths that I was working towards. Uh, and so it really motivated me to be a teacher. And I had an experience uh, that was kind of my defining moment. I had been working with um, my advisor in college, and I was working on a minor in history. And uh, I got in this class, and it was the time when the web was kind of iffy, and they weren't sure if they were allowed to share pictures. And the teacher told us, uh, I was ancient third world civilizations, and he said, we're not going to be allowed to use any images in this class because part of our class is in another city and we can't broadcast. And I said, ancient third world civilizations, no images. I said, I'm out. And so I decided not to pursue my history major. And my teacher told me, she says, look, you can't do just one thing because then you become a technology teacher. You're an elective. They don't have to hire you. You're kind of useless in the school. And I said, well, I'm going to be so good at what I do that they have to hire me. And so we got involved in a few different things. And that kind of motivated me because I wanted students to have an expert uh, to be able to help them. So this group you're looking at here uh, is where it all started for me. I got involved in Business Professionals of America, and I spent a year as our state president, uh, and then in 2007, I was elected to be the national president uh, for our conference that we held in New York City. So it was a great experience. Uh, wrapped up my undergraduate degree, and then I share this picture because uh, it's just a blast. I then did a master's with Full Sail University, and in one of our classes, uh, this is actually me and my father-in-law sitting on the tower in World of Warcraft. 
uh, completing our final mission for our game strategy and motivation course at Full Sail University. Uh, it was one of the most enlightening programs that I've been able to be a part of. It was just spectacular. Uh, so I thought you might appreciate that this evening. Um, and then I got involved with Adobe. Uh, again, it was just a desire to be better and learn more. Uh, and I needed to find people who were good at the things that I was trying to be good at. Uh, so the folks you see in this picture have kind of come become my learning community. Uh, so left to right is Matthias Klossner from the Netherlands. Uh, and then Ronaldo Lawrence, he is from the UK. And uh, Leonard Braber, who is from the Netherlands and teaches with Matthias as well. Uh, we had a chance to go this summer to Pixar. It was a great experience. Um, but these folks from all over the world, uh, this individual, uh, Nicole DeLacio, uh, she is from California, teaches young students. Uh, I was always amazed. I didn't realize third graders could handle Photoshop. Uh, but they did things in Photoshop that we would never have dreamed up in my classroom. So there's a lot of fun kind of connecting and learning and doing things um, with individuals. So it's pretty cool. Um, <clears throat> and then I just want to wrap up my story with this bus that we saw in San Francisco. This was um, this is how I try to live every single day of my life with my students. I want to take what other people's dreams and everybody sees as possible, and I just want to make all of that jealous and like do things that are so great for kids that it just makes our dreams just explode. So anyways, those were a few images I wanted to share with you. And this is kind of what drives my classroom. So when you talk about my story, this is my story. I'm trying to kind of you know, live in a future that other people can kind of see but aren't too sure about. So anyway, that's kind of my story, my background, where I come from. So um, I'm trying to think here what I should share with you next. I have a couple little pieces in here that I'd like to share. Um, so my computer lab uh, that I taught in for several years, uh, here's a picture of it. Uh, we got the Macs, uh, the, white de the clear desk and my white chair. That's my design. Like, I liked it. Uh, and so I went with it. I got the bright LED lights in the table just so when we kill the lights and we start projecting, uh, it kind of demands control from the students. I don't have really like discipline issues and stuff like that. Uh, because when I turn on the desk, I turn on the projector, everybody just kind of is quiet. They listen. Uh, so I kind of have this atmosphere that demands respect. Uh, and it's one of those things that I've just spent years becoming an expert at what I do. Just a consistent, nonstop, trying to learn anything I can. So when the kid comes in my room, they know they're getting a first-rate experience. Uh, and I try to get them with that from the beginning. You know, the high-gloss white countertops, the gray, you know, desk base, and just everything about it kind of commands their attention and it changes their thought process. Um, so one story and one situation I did have happen in the classroom, I'm going to go through uh, some of my pictures with you here. Uh, but what happened to me is I had a student that wanted to do photography. And I didn't know anything about photography. And I told her that. And she said, well, but you could learn, right? Like, you could go and experience something and learn. And I said, well, sure. So I went to Photoshop World. I knew nothing about photography when I went. Uh, and I learned some stuff over those few days. And then at the end, they did these drawings. And I wasn't even sure what they were drawing for. And they called out this prize. It was a digital workshops with David Black. Uh, David Black, I didn't know at the time. It, really like famous, well-accomplished photographer, uh, did a lot of work in the Olympics, spent, you know, 10, 11 years on an NFL sideline. And the whole crowd kind of was like, oh, wow, that's like so cool. I can't believe they're giving it away. Well, I won it. And I didn't know anything. 
about any of it. And so I got on this trip to Yosemite. Uh, and so this is some of the work that we did uh, here in Yosemite. I'll share with you uh, some of those in just a moment. But it's, uh, that trip kind of fueled me. I learned in those three days what would have taken me years to learn uh, from the expert. And it really only took three days when you have an expert in the room. And so I came back, and this is some of my more recent work uh, that we did. We did this out one night. We were waiting for the lunar eclipse. Uh, that's on Lake Coeur d'Alene in northern Idaho. Uh, and we took some of these pictures at the last Photoshop world that I went to. Um, you know, so just some work that we've done recently. But this all stemmed out of, you know, a student that wanted to learn about photography. I went to a couple workshops and came back able to share and teach. So this is one we did with our students uh, about a year after I had been in Yosemite. Uh, at night, so it's all dark, the camera is open for a couple minutes, uh, and we do some of this with a red spotlight is how we do that. Um, so this is one that we did last summer out at the Adobe Ed Leader Conference. Just set up the tripod and waited for the waves and stuff to come in. It was really pretty fun uh, to do something like this in the dark. So, uh, And then the last picture I just wanted to share with you, this is one of my personal uh, favorites. So this picture, uh, about four hours before we took this picture, everybody was out uh, taking pictures. We're doing these star trails over Half Dome in Yosemite, and my camera battery died. And I'm a pretty determined person, and I wasn't going home without one of these amazing star trail pictures. So I uh, went home. I went back to the hotel. It was about a 30-minute drive, and I put my battery on the charger, and I started packing up my hotel room. And at about 1 in the morning, my battery was finally charged, and I left my hotel. And I went and camped in this stream. It was about 2 in the morning when I opened the shutter. And uh, the shutter was open for about an hour and 15 minutes that I sat in the complete pitch black of Yosemite. And so this picture you're looking at was taken at 2 in the morning in the pitch black and is solely illuminated by the stars. It's the only light that came into the camera, and we didn't add any post-production uh, like exposure or anything to this. So what you're seeing is how it came out of the camera, uh, minus you know some despeckles and stuff from the noise being open that long. Uh, but that's so that's all illuminated by starlight. And I teach this lesson to my kids in the first day of class. And I talked to them about determination and having to want something. You know, I really wanted this image, and I went through a lot of sacrifice to get it. Um, I stayed up all night getting it, and then I went and shot pictures all the next day as well. Um, and I really earned this one. So I try to tell the kids that concept of, you know, earning your work and making it turn out for you. So anyways, that's some of the work that I have done. Um, and I just do it not just to motivate my students, to let them know, hey, I know what I'm doing. You know what you want to do, so let's get together and accomplish some really great things. And so that's kind of the environment that I try to set up in the classroom is an environment where everybody kind of gets that, like, you know, I know what I'm talking about, but I'm open to listening to, you know, your ideas and helping you create some great things too. So anyway. Thanks for sharing that, Dan. It's really inspiring. Well, thank you. I hope so. I mean, it's one of those things, you know, you have to, like, find it, and you just got to go get it. And sometimes that's what it takes to accomplish something. Yes. I think it's particularly important. I know, you know, I work at Adobe, and I'm still learning Adobe tools every day. There's something new that comes out or new techniques that I don't know. And it can be daunting. But if you have that creative passion and the support from an educator like you, it's really possible to, to push yourself and move forward. So I appreciate just uh, hearing how you keep yourself motivated as well. Yeah. Yeah, you got to create some stuff and uh, let the kids know that you know how to do it too and uh, just have some fun with it. Definitely. So... Um, I don't know. I mean, I could show you then. I guess we could talk about some of the student work, maybe, that we do in the classroom. Yeah, 
good. You want to okay. tell, give us a little bit about your background in terms of uh, a little bit more about what you teach and where you teach and uh, what the environment's like? Yeah, okay. Uh, so I teach at uh, Skyview High School in Nampa, Idaho. Uh, this is my eighth year of teaching. Uh, so I do digital media. Uh, they have me teaching right now some computer applications classes. So I'm doing some Word and Excel and PowerPoint. Um, in fact, that's mainly what I'm teaching right now. And I'm in a situation, I think, where a lot of teachers end up where you maybe only have the opportunity to teach one or two courses in some of these creative fields. Uh, so I have two classes of Intro to Multimedia. So we get 16 weeks. Uh, it is a required class for our students to graduate. So we get 16 weeks with our sophomores uh, to teach them everything that we hope they learn. And then we don't see them again. And so it's kind of a daunting task you know, with all the tools that are available. Trying to squeeze things into 16 weeks is you know, sometimes very challenging. Um, so I'm dealing with sophomores, so 10th grade students. Uh, many of them have had zero exposure to the Adobe tools. Um, you know, our community, we live in a Title I school. Uh, so, you know, we have some of those economic challenges to deal with, uh, you know, especially as it comes to technology, you know, and what these kids have been exposed to at home. So. We're kind of starting from scratch when we start getting into this, and we have 16 weeks to get them to, you know, somewhat of proficiency in what they're doing. So it's pretty intense undertaking sometimes. Mm -hmm. I would imagine, and I'm sure a lot of the educators who are listening can relate to that situation, being in 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 a teaching environment where there's lots of pressure, short timelines, limited resources. Those are things I think as educators, many of us can relate to. Um, how are some of the ways that you managed to get past some of those limitations and to build that beautiful classroom that you showed us just a few images ago? Yeah, so well, here's where we're at, right? So the classroom I was showing you, um, that was built at uh, my last school about, I spent my first six years there, and it started out uh, just a normal, regular classroom uh, with, you know, some countertops and stuff that were getting a little older. Um, and so we worked, and what we did really, the way that you build something like this is you have to create an image for other people around you, right? The reason we were able to do what we did at my last school is we were able to build a system to where people knew we could design anything, and that every time we designed it, it would look right, and it would be perfect. And so we kind of worked with, you know, all of those things um, from the get-go. And so over the years, you know, we have um, kind of used that as the launching point. So the way you get that program to move is you got to create a product or a skill or a service that other people see as valuable. Um, you know, so it started with us hosting like, um, you know, state basketball tournaments and other things, and we would create the bracket and we'd put team logos on it and all that kind of stuff. And so it kind of built our image within the school. And, uh, you know, getting your kids involved in some student organizations, like we do Business Professionals of America. And uh, so we have kids that are going to national contests um, every year, and they're placing in the top 10 in things like graphic design and desktop publishing and all of that. So, you know, once they see the kids kind of doing that, you know, then um, it creates that momentum for your program is what it does. And so we've just done it with student achievement, student work, um, you know, and certainly, you know, the Adobe tools have been very helpful in all of that. Great. So what's really interesting about making your, your program visible through its successes and proving its value through other ways that you can serve the school community. I find that really interesting. I'm wondering also, are there ways that you've, you've engaged other educators who may not be as familiar with the type of work you're doing in your classroom? Do you, do you draw other te teachers into your classroom? Yeah, I think, and I don't know how much I get them into the classroom as much as I have to kind of take our classroom uh, to them. You know, we do things like this, but, um, 
you know, I put on a lot of sessions. Like generally, there's some kind of a you know summer conference. Like for us, uh, we're a CTE program, and so we have a summer conference where the state kind of gets together. And I just make sure when I get together at those meetings, I'm offering to share. So I'm putting together workshops to try to make something meaningful uh, for some of those teachers when they come. And also, you know, it's starting to spread more and more now in Idaho. It used to be very isolated where I was kind of the only guy. Uh, but now we've kind of spread that out a little more. And so now I'm getting a chance to really network with people and kind of learn from them. Uh, but I got all that when I first got in with Adobe back in 2010. Uh, the reason I ended up going to Adobe Max in 2010 and I went because I kind of always taught this philosophy to my students too. I said, you know, um, you need to figure out who you want to be and then you're going to surround yourself with people who are already there. And then in the process, you're going to become like them. And so I did that with Adobe Max. I said, you know, the people that are at Adobe Max are doing what I want to do. So I went and met some people at Adobe Max. And I spent time with those people, and I learned from them. And, you know, I don't think that I'm quite like them yet, but they are some spectacular people that I'm working towards, you know, continually learning from those type of people. So no matter what you do in your classroom or whatever you teach, you got to have that core group of people that is where you want to be so you can kind of surround yourself with them and gain from them. So that's kind of, you know, what I do is I try to share that with teachers and get involved with people who are already doing it. Great. Thank you. Yeah. I had a couple little questions I wanted to ask you from Darkus. Are your classes semester long or year long? And do you administer a state exam or teacher made exam? Yeah, so we have semester classes. Um, and our state is doing some interesting work uh, for. Like, if we had, uh, since it's only a semester class, we don't have, like, a required test. Um, but when you do have a graphic design program, uh, like we had in my previous school, then you're dealing with, there is a statewide test. Uh, they do make us take a workplace readiness test, which is more of, like, a general, is this person ready for the workplace, uh, which is difficult, you know, because then you have to work that into the curriculum as well. Uh, you know, and so one of the things that we're looking to use is like the Adobe ACA exams. Uh, I do those with my students in my classroom. Um, our state legislation has paid for a lot of the funding that covers the cost of those tests. Um, also, though, our student organization, Business Professionals of America, they offer those tests at the national conference for just like not very much. It's a hugely discounted price uh, where they're connected. So you might find some options for cheaper tests through like your student organization or possibly your state has created some funding to help some of those students. But that's kind of generally what we do is we kind of focus on that Adobe ACA exam. Great. Well, that's a good transition into talking a little bit more about some of the examples of student work you were, you were alluding to before. Do you want to move into that? Yeah, let me, let me share some of this um, with you. I'm going to open it up. Um, most of what I'm going to show you today is from Illustrator, uh, just because there's some really great uh, work that my students have done um, in Illustrator. And I just think it would be really cool for you to see kind of the parts and pieces of all of that. So. Um, and we'll just kind of work through these and break them down for you a little bit. I'm not sure how familiar everyone is with Illustrator. It's not something that gets taught quite as regularly as Photoshop. Uh, but uh, for now, I love Illustrator. It's a great tool. It's the one I always start with. I start every class. Every time I start a semester, start in Illustrator. Um, and the main reason is because these kids are faced with a blank canvas. And it's very intimidating for them uh, to have nothing to work off of. And so we kind of start them, you know, right in the middle of the fire, like, you know. So like this example here, uh, they had to just draw something. 
Uh, this is from one of my students, you know, as they're getting towards the end of Illustrator, they've kind of learned a few things. Uh, but what we've got is, if you're not familiar with Illustrator, we're dealing with line segments and anchor points and free drawing. So they created these guitars for a championship that we did. Uh, we had a Guitar Hero championship back a while ago. And so they're modeled after Billy Joe Armstrong, the lead singer of Green Day. It's his original guitar. Okay. So if I select it all, you can see these anchor points and these line segments that go into this drawing. Uh, so all these little circles we've got in here, clear down to like the original stickers uh, that he had on the artwork uh, on his guitar. Okay. So there's a lot of data going on in here, but I just wanted you to kind of see what we're dealing with. So the drawing itself looks really great. Uh, but it's just the application of some basic uh, principles inside of Illustrator that really make it wonderful. I really like to show you a good close-up of these little knobs down here because they're just knobs on a guitar, uh, but they've got a gradient mesh on them that really does some nice things to kind of shade those in. So these are some things you might see like a student start creating towards like the end of a year maybe in Illustrator. Uh, so, like, these ones came from a student when I had a program that was, you know, two years long. This is after about probably two semesters of media, not solely Illustrator, but, um, you know. So, uh, this next one is a similar situation. Uh, we teach the kids all about reference images. So, if I zoom out, you can kind of see there's, like, lots of artwork scattered all over. Um, but this castle is all built in perspective mode. Uh, for example, this particular prompt for the assignment, I had told the students I wanted them to make a perspective game board. Okay, it's like a Monopoly board looking at it from one corner is what they were supposed to make. And the kids said, well, I want to do this castle. And I said, okay, then make a castle. It's going to be way harder. And he said, oh, that's all right. I think it'll be cool. I said, I'm sure it will be. Uh, so we got some 3D tools involved in this. Like if you just look at it, those are all the shapes. Okay, uh, the cones are just little arcs. These are straight lines that have a revolve effect applied to them. Uh, so it's pretty cool to kind of see how far they can push that. Um, you know, and there's a lot of technical stuff that happened in this one, but again, it's probably about like week 10 or 11 of exposure in Illustrator. So it's not like these are taking great amounts of time. If you had a semester class just on illustration, you could get your kids to this point without any trouble at all. Um, a lot of what we do, though, is we do a lot of recreation. And we kind of teach these kids how this all works. So here's the example. Um, we were putting on a basketball tournament. And the local school sent us this logo. And this, this is what we use. And uh, it was like 12 kilobytes. Super tiny. Uh, wouldn't have even been big enough for, you know, like a profile picture. And so what we do is we have the student then take this image, and they have to come into Illustrator and recreate it. Uh, because what we do is a lot of large format work. So if you look at like some of these layers, I mean, the shoe, the left leg, the black, the stinger, the right leg, okay, all these pieces have been built. And so then when you turn it on now, this is the actual illustration. And it's made up just of uh, anchor points and line segments. So as I select it, you'll see... Um, there's just kind of this nice illustration. So this kind of work is extremely valuable out there in the real world where you've got a logo. It needs to be made large, and so you're going to go recreate that inside of Illustrator. Um, and then I got one more to show you in Illustrator. I just I had to because it's my favorite. Uh, this is our little alien invasion. Uh, we had the students were challenged to make an alien invasion. And this particular student, as she was creating, noticed that everybody else was creating invasions of the city. And she didn't want to create an invasion of the city because everybody else was doing it. 
So she did the farm. Uh, symbol tools. These are hand-drawn little spaceships that she made. Um, and then she brought them into Illustrator and did them digitally. Uh, did a very great job with that. I did have to show you my favorite part. I hope that you get a good laugh out of this. This is uh, the crying cow. Uh, he's sitting here crying as he's being abducted by the aliens. So I just thought the depth of her ideas and creativity were great. And you can see, again, they're using reference images over here um, as ideas for what's going on. So um, it's just kind of a great piece of work. So. Uh, and then I had a couple others I wanted to show you that were a little different, uh, some things we've done. So this is an example of some of the competition uh, that we enter. Uh, so Business Professionals America, they make the students create a logo and a poster. So in this case, the inkwell and the pen is the logo, and then write a little tagline. And so this is made in Illustrator along with some work in Photoshop. Um, again, all original artwork that's drawn in inside of Illustrator. So, um, and I wanted to show you how those kids will blossom. So Sierra here that drew that last picture you just saw, um, she, her and I only got to work together for about, we got met up in December, and then she was a teacher's aide with me until, uh, you know, May, and then she graduated. So she hadn't had too much exposure to some of these tools, and I, she really loved it, but I wondered how she would do. Uh, so this is her portfolio she submitted last semester to Brigham Young University um, to get into their advertising program. Uh, and like I said, this was made in you know about a year after we first got together. Um, and so she talks about how she would zone out at times playing with Barbies and then realized that she was just born to create. Um, and so then inside of this, uh, I really thought it came out right here, uh, in some of her creativity. Uh, so her skills, she just kind of put in these metrics, you know, for like you might see in a video game or something. I just thought it was spectacular um, ideas and thought um, to put it together that way. Um, and these are things that she just put together because she loved. Uh, icebreakers duo, um, some creative things that went in there with, uh, you know, I really liked this idea of, uh, you know, putting the advertisement on the conveyor belt at the store I thought was pretty great. Um, and then uh, just the creativity really comes out here. Um, I love this one right here. What kind of fruit is Juicy Fruit Gum? It's peach mango and a drop or two of pineapple. But ironically, it doesn't consist of juicy fruit at all. It's actually dried fruit. After approximately 15 minutes of chomping and swallowing on such a dry lump of rubber, you'd be better off to try another brand of gum. Or better yet, ditch the gum and have an icebreaker's duo mint instead. Uh, I just thought that really pulls out her creativity and like who she is. Uh, it's very wonderful work. So really what it is, especially in a high school, you have to remember what you're creating is lifetime creators. You're helping students create a career. And being versatile is a very important part of this. Um, so I'm going to show you two other examples, and then I think that will probably enough to give you an idea what we do. Uh, so I also teach an IT class. And in this IT class, we did some work with uh, Unity Player and fuse okay so my little character here uh, everything you're seeing this guy runs really fast so that we can demo easily uh, the sand the water the texture out here the trees the mountains uh, all this is made by the students okay we teach them how to create texture in Photoshop and then how can we bring that into a 3d environment and apply it okay the character that we're seeing here uh, he's made in Fuse. Uh, it's a brand new tool that just was released. Uh, it may still even be in pre-release, I think. Uh, but it is a wonderful tool that you can introduce to your students. Okay. Um, I didn't know how to do any of this. I didn't know anything about Unity or game creation or 3D modeling um, until I got involved with the Adobe Gen Pro classes. 
which we'll talk about. But I did that that lesson that I'm, we're looking at. This one's kind of fun. Uh, this one, a student got one of his cars put in here. I'll show you it real quick. Um, oh, don't fail now. Come on, Safari. Oh, there we go. Sorry, sometimes you just take a minute because it's pretty uh, complex. So this one, you know, we got the car, a little bit of uh, idling sound in here, so off we go. Um, and he drew the road and everything. It's kind of fun, so. We can kind of take a drive through his island. And it uh, sounds like we need another gear in the car, but then, you know, you can crash and stuff in it too, but all kind of some fun things uh, that we did in Unity. Got a little backup lights there. So, anyway. Um, but that's some of the stuff the students are creating. Um, and we did that as a result of, you know, I took a six-week Adobe Gen Pro class through the Adobe Ed Exchange, and they taught us everything we'd need to know. They gave us all the tutorial videos. And I was able to implement that in about six weeks in my class. We went from never having done it uh, to those little demos I just showed you. So it was a pretty exciting process for us to kind of work along with that Adobe Gen Pro class right as it was being done. It was really spectacular. So anyways, those are some of the things that we're creating right now in the classroom. It's just been a lot of fun. and. Having the creative cloud from Adobe versus like a package of software, you know, like CS5 or 6, it's a little older. Uh, like the characters that we have in that game, they're made with Adobe Fuse, so they pushed it out to the creative cloud on a Monday. On Wednesday, we had it installed and working in our computer lab. It was very easy for the IT department, very seamless transition. It was great. Dan, I was wondering, uh, there's a, some comments in the chat box a little bit about uh, testing and how you balance the, these great creative projects with the needs to actually prepare kids for the certification. Um, I'm just wondering if you can comment on that, because it sounds fantastic that you could take in six weeks these new products and new techniques and teach kids. Uh -huh. How do you blend that with the, the, the needs to get uh, kids prepared for the ACA and other certification exams. Yeah. Well, I mean, if we open up this one again, uh, you know, we look at this Unity thing. Okay, so we're playing with Unity, right? But the reality is, when you look at this texture, like in the sand, that has to be made in Photoshop, right? And so we're teaching the kids, like, how do you make a texture that blends with itself so it doesn't look like a tiled pattern? Because when you're looking at this grass and everything, it's a 512 pixel by 512 pixel image. And it's been blended together thousands of times. Uh, if you look back in the mountains here, you can kind of see it on those mountains off in the distance. But as you get closer, uh, it becomes nearly impossible to distinguish where the texture is. And so teaching those kids relevant skills in Photoshop then applying those skills to a real world project is how we do it. Um, you know, like with uh, some of the posters we were looking at, like a poster like this, you know, the, the time, the effort, the preparation that goes into this type of competition is going to do far more to prepare that student for an ACA exam than it is, you know, if you were just to sit down and teach the kid how to do it. Um, like this is work that was all done outside of the classroom. Okay, so in the classroom, I give them like the basics. Uh, you know, like when you think about like these illustrations that we looked at, this is just giving the student a tool, showing them how it works. Then they explore with it. And I mean, when you look at a drawing like this, you know that this student is going to pass an exam, right? And I just make sure that what I teach them flows with what's expected on the ACA exam. Okay, so there's a balance in there, but you have to take like what they're learning and make sure it fits with that exam. But also, I just kind of give the kids the specs for the exam and say, here's what you got to know. 
And so then as they find something on there they don't know about, you know, then we can go over that or work with that in class. Uh, the intro classes, like what I teach now, are a lot more structured. They're like, okay, this is exactly what we have to do because you got to graduate. Um, but if you can get, you know, a TA or a situation where they're doing independent study and kind of work one-on-one -on -one with some kids, like the kids that really love it, that's when these great projects start to come about. It kind of requires a little bit of that one on one attention at times. Thank you. I think that's really helpful. I mean, it's just down to the project. I mean, you give the kids something they're passionate about, and they will come out with the required skills. That. Well, great, Dan. Do you want to also? I think you had something to share with us of a how to, a project you wanted to share with the uh, group. Yeah, what I thought I would share with everybody is I thought maybe since Illustrator is something that either we're, you know, not maybe that exposed to, I thought I'd kind of give you a breakdown um, of what we do in Illustrator in six weeks in my classroom. Uh, so you can kind of have an idea at how that pace goes. So I'm just going to kind of do a brief of what we would do in, say, six in six weeks to kind of give you an idea how far we get, okay? Um, so we teach the kids about new documents. Uh, I generally have them use a four by four artboard, and we'll do like three or four of those artboards uh, straight across. So when they start a new project, this is really what their project looks like. Um, and I just tell them is you're going to need some space to draw stuff, and you're going to want it in different artboards and stuff. So. We go through that explanation kind of day one of how to set that up. Um, and then in day two, uh, I just go straight for the shape tools, OK? So I teach them about right here. We don't go over the interface. I don't sit here and tell them where every button is. I just get right down to it. I got six weeks. I know what they need to learn. So week one is all about the shape tools, OK? And we do the rectangle, OK? But I also teach them, well, OK, if you do a rectangle and you hold Shift, it'll make it square, OK? But if you hold Shift and Alt, then it will make it square, but it'll get bigger from the center out. So we kind of teach them everything about the tools, right? So when we do the star tool, OK, you get a star, right? But if you're dragging it out and you push up and down on your arrow, the up and down arrows, it adds multiple points to the star. And if you hold Alt or Option, uh, sorry, yeah, there we go. Uh, command, sorry, Control or Command, I got my keys wrong. If you hold Command or Control, it'll let you change like how pointy that star is. It controls the center radius, OK? We also teach them if you just click on the page, then you can come set up the star inside of a dialog box. So we spend an entire week just on shapes. And then we have them do things like they got to build a house out of a shape, OK? So they'll go grab their rectangle, all right? And they'll get their star, and they'll drag it out. And they say, well, I only need it to have three points. I'll hold Shift so it's straight, OK? And we really hammer these shape tools big time. And then they might continue and draw windows and other things. Okay, But that's all we do in week one is shapes. Okay, Then in week two, we do the same thing. We get four new artboards. And this time we're going to do more shapes. But instead now, what we're going to do is we're going to take these shapes, and we're going to show them how if you draw a rectangle, and a circle, and you overlap those pieces, then you can select them. And you're going to use this Shape Builder tool to kind of combine those into one, to one shape. So we teach them how to draw irregular shapes with multiple shape tools. Okay, And then the project I use for this week in week one, uh, sorry, this week two, is I have them do uh, movie icons. 
So they got to take their favorite movie, break it down into four icons. So I'll show you an example. Uh, I did one recently, and sorry, I don't have it right here. I got to go get it. Um, but I did one recently for Star Wars. Okay, and uh, maybe if I can find it here. Sorry, guys. And uh, so I did Star Wars, and I used it as an example for them in class. So I've got R2-D2, the lightsaber, the Millennial Falcon, and the Death Star. All of these were created only with basic shapes and the Shape Builder tool right here. That's it. That's all we do in week two is basic shapes and the Shape Builder tool. And they start to learn how to design some of this stuff and be able to simplify and visualize things, okay? So then you can see now here at the end of week two, we're getting into color a little bit, okay? So now we're going to do the same thing. Week number three, we're going to open up our four blank artboards. I'm going to come grab, you know, a square. I'm going to say, okay, that's a square. And you might be tempted to go here to fill in stroke. I always, always teach my students to use this appearance panel. If you haven't seen it before or used it, I hope that you start to. So here's what we do with the appearance panel. It houses everything. All right, so here's my square. So it has a black stroke on it. Okay, it has a white fill. So if I click on the fill, I can change it to blue. I can go to the stroke, change it to pink. I can make it thicker. I can click on stroke, and there's my entire stroke panel. I have options to add effects down here. So it all exists inside this appearance panel. So we teach them basic fill and stroke in week three. Then in week four, it gets crazy. Because what we do is I have them draw an oval. OK, oh, that's a terrible. That's not what I wanted. I wanted the rounded rectangle. OK, and then we have them kind of round off the corners. I'm using the up and down arrow keys. And it starts to resemble kind of like a racetrack. OK, and then I teach these kids how we can take this shape and create a compelling appearance. So, for example, I'm just going to create something here real quick. Uh, I'm going to put like a big heavy stroke on this. OK. I'm going to make a new stroke. So I have two now. I'm going to change the top one to black. And I'm going to reduce its size down a little bit, maybe like to 11, 12. I'll make another copy of that stroke. And I'm going to make this one white. And I'm going to make it really thin. And since I got the stroke panel, I'll make it a dashed line as well. OK? And then we just turn the middle of it to like green. So I've got kind of this infield with this road going on. And then I'll apply an effect to it, maybe like um, have a stylized. Let's see, what do we got? Texture, maybe. Um, yeah, so we'll use some texture in here. Uh, and I like to use this sandstone. It looks good to me. And so then now I got some texture. So what I end up with is this kind of appearance where I have some effects applied to it. But all it is is just a single shape. And so we really focus on the shapes and the appearance panel. And then final week, week number six, we do some drawing with the pen tool in like week five. And I show them, uh, like for example, I don't know if you know this, we'll see. Uh, so my pen tool does kind of these objects here. And I need to get that, there we go. But now if I want, I can use this curvature tool it's really cool. What it does is I can grab hold of that line and curve it. So if you've ever used a pen tool, I don't have to deal too much with anchor points and line segments and handles as much as I can. I can just use this curvature tool. And I can kind of draw out my shape here. Okay. So it is pretty a cool little deal. Um, but what we'll teach them along with the pen tool and the curvature tool is kind of how to make these shapes like this. 
And then finally, in week six, we do this thing. Uh, I have them draw a perfect circle, and I have them pick their favorite color. Okay, so in this case, I'm going to make this one red, or maybe blue. I'll do blue. Uh, a little bit darker. Okay. And then we use this tool over here called the gradient mesh. Okay. And what this does is when I click on this object, it's going to add an anchor point here and other anchor points around the edge. But they're special. This point, if I select it, I can actually change the color of that anchor point, and it will change that color on the shape. And so we teach them how with just that gradient mesh, they can color this object to really give it a 3D feel, but it's only in 2D. So in six weeks, they're doing shapes, the pen tool, the appearance panel, and gradients and meshes. And that's kind of what I do with them in that six-week period. And then I throw them out a project at the end. I tell them to go find their favorite cartoon, uh, and then we bring it into Illustrator and have them recreate that cartoon. Uh, but I think in those five weeks, breaking it down into those tools, you'll probably hit about 60 to 70 percent of the ACA exam for Illustrator uh, just with those five weeks of classes. So anyways, there's a lot there. I know I went fast, but I wanted to kind of give you a brief overview of what we do uh, with something like Illustrator. So yeah. And how many, how many hours per week do you have your students? Uh, yeah, a day and B day. So some weeks I get them three hours. Other weeks I get them for like four and a half. Some weeks I get them for less. I mean, we have, you know, standardized testing and everything else too, like everyone. So the kids have to know, and I tell them at the beginning of class, this is not going to be like kick your feet up and just kind of hang out and draw some pictures. I tell them, I said, we're serious about what we're doing. We're going to try to get you a career. Um, and so we have to be busy and working in my classroom. It's a great message. Well, we're getting to the top of the hour, so I wanted to give you an opportunity, Dan, if there's anything, any closing remarks you wanted to make, and also invite our guests, if you have any additional questions for Dan, this is a great chance to put him in the, in the um, chat box, and we'll make sure he can address those before we go. Yeah, so the last thing I want to say, I was on the radio the other day, and they were interviewing me, and I had kind of talked to them about all these creative tools, and the guy says, okay, so now Dan, I want to stop you, so I want to ask you a real simple question. He said, what are you creating with all this stuff? Right, like he didn't get it. He didn't understand what I was talking about. And I looked at I don't even know why I said it, but as I've had a chance to reflect, it was the perfect response. I looked at him, and I said, well, it's simple. We are creating careers with all this stuff. That's what we're here to do as a teacher is we're here to help this kid find a passion. And if they love it, then we got to help them create a career out of it. Right? So, I mean, whether it's math or science or whatever, you got to find a way. If that's the kid's thing and they're going to be a mathematician, I mean, you got to show them the next level. you got to say, okay, we have six months left together, and I'm going to point you to who you go to next. And that's what you got to do as a high school teacher. If they don't know where they're going in August when everyone else goes back to school and they're graduated, well, they got a problem. So that's what we do. We say to them, here's some tools. It could be a career, and uh, this is where you go to the next level. You know, you've outgrown me. It's time to find the next person. So, anyways, that's my message to us as teachers is we have to inspire that kid to go after their passion, and they got to know what it is by the time they graduate. So. Well, thank you. That's a great message. So I'm just going to switch screens just briefly to give you a chance to give us a little feedback, and also you can still ask Dan some questions as we close. But, Dan... Let me just take this last moment uh, to say thank you so much. Your comments today were fantastic. I learned a lot in the process, and I, and I hope our guests enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, really appreciate the, the comments about motivation and how to really keep kids on a path for a great career. 
uh, and your specifics about how to, how to introduce those products over the yeah. course of in a short course is really inspiring. So I did want to make point out that I did list the upcoming professional development courses on edX. Those are links there. You can get involved with our Adobe Gen Pro courses that a couple people mentioned in the chat box. Simply go to edX.adobe.com and check out the professional development tab for our live courses and events. You'll see them listed there. We also have a number of on-demand courses that you can take that are self-paced on any number of our tools and often, they often include great input and direction from AALs like Dan. So you'll hear more, more great tips about how you can integrate these, these techniques and tools into your classroom. Um, oh, sorry. There we go. So the poll is now open in case you want to go ahead and give us your feedback. Again, thank you. I'll leave this open for a few more minutes to get your input, and I hope you join us for another session of In My Creative Classroom in the future if they're offered every month, uh, generally on the third Wednesday of the month.